The next contribution is entitled Dispersion, Support, and Bimetallic Effects in Fischer Trub Synthesis on Cobalt Catalyst. It's a contribution from the University of California at Berkeley and Exxon's Corporate Research Laboratory. Authors include uh, Inglesia, Soled, Fiado, and Via. The presentation will be given by Professor Inglesia. And if anybody can't hear me in the back of the room, we'll be happy to put a microphone on. <laughs> now, if anybody can't hear me in the back, they're going to put an earphone on. <laughs> um, well, I guess uh, dispersion, support, and bimetallic effects. That should cover everything, right? And it's going to be very difficult to do it in 25 minutes. And as a result of that, I'm going to dispense rather quickly with the first two because they tend to be rather unremarkable, at least at the conditions that we're operating this chemistry for the kinds of materials they're going to be working with. And I'm going to concentrate on bimetallic effects, and I'm going to narrow it down to the one bimetallic system that actually worked, because I could go on and talk about others that did not work. And one is specifically that shows a type of bimetallic effect or bimetallic promotional effect that is largely unexplored in our view, and is, which is very difficult to detect. And as a result of it, most of the talk is going to deal with this cobalt catalyst that have very small amounts of ruthenium. First of all, let's remember what fischer synthesis is all about. It's about making C5 plus and high molecular weight hydrocarbons. So one of the restrictions that I'm going to impose on the work is that most of the conclusions have to apply at conditions that give you that high molecular weight distribution. And as a result of it, we're going to be working at fairly low temperatures, high pressures, and C5 plus selectivities, which are generally higher than 85%. This is not methanation chemistry. This is true fischer tropsch chemistry. Now, if you look, for example, at the rate of this reaction, normalized to the total number of atoms of cobalt that you have in the system, total, surface plus bulk, everything that you have there, and you plot that versus the fraction of those total cobalt atoms that are at the surface of the crystallites, you get a straight line. Well, first of all, how do you measure this? You measure it by hydrogen chemisorption by the method proposed by the Bartholomew group. What is included here is a bunch of different supports, a bunch of different precursors, and actually a bunch of different pretreatments. And what you find is that when you take all those things into consideration, you're still able to draw that straight line throughout that entire data set. What does it say? It says that a cobalt surface atom is a cobalt surface atom is a cobalt surface atom. If it were not, I would worry. And the reason I would worry is because we are, unfortunately, in a dispersion range where it would be hard for anybody to imagine that these huge cobalt crystals can actually feel either the presence of the support or the different facets that are exposed at that surface. And you may ask the questions, well, why do we operate here? Well, we operate there because, in general, this is a typical dispersion range for cobalt. And moreover, if you insist on moving out here by either using strongly interacting supports or strongly interacting precursors, what will happen is your small particles will generally tend to reoxidize. Because, again, we're insisting on operating at conditions where you're going to have to have a high water partial pressure. So this applies, first of all, over this dispersion range for these types of materials and, in general, at these types of conditions which are relevant to fischer trope synthesis. Now, mind you, the support and the precursor do make a difference. They do determine whether you sit here in dispersion or you sit here in dispersion. So in that sense, they act to give you either a good catalyst or a bad catalyst. But once I count the number of cobalt surface atoms, then I can locate myself <coughs> on what appears to be a fairly universal curve. And as a result of it, if I now do the usual thing, which is to divide the rate of that reaction now by the dispersion, and I get a turnover rate or side time yield, now again I find that this side time yield is fairly uniform, independent of what the support is and what the dispersion is. This, however, is disappointing. Because after all, what you would like to do is you would like to keep on moving off this curve as far as possible. Well, it does not seem like we're going to be able to do that. So the alternative is going to be to move ourselves onto another curve and to find one component that somehow gives you perhaps another one of these lines here and perhaps another line up here somewhere. And the usual fallback position at this point is to pick a second metal component and try to introduce it into the system and see if you can get several types of promotion that people have talked about. Chemical promotion, structural promotion, or what we're going to call site protection. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, 
this. The fact is that all these processes are fairly well known. If you take some irreducible or unreducible metal oxide materials, you can actually use it to stabilize the surface area of iron-based catalyst. And effectively, a structural promoter will move you up and down along the same line. Well, this is the way that supports would generally work, right? They prevent the sintering of crystallized and will determine where you sit on that line. The more interesting one is actually one in which each one of the sides becomes, for some reason, more active. That's what we're looking for. A third type, which I think is largely unexplored, is a suppose, as Professor Holman said a few minutes ago, that only a small fraction of the sites are actually active. And what you measure here is the total number. This only implies that there is a proportionality. It does not tell you what the actual site activity is. And suppose that the second component that you put into the system manages to preserve a larger number of those sites available for the reaction. Then you would inadvertently fall into this line and conclude that you have a chemical promotion effect. In fact, that is what has been proposed for the effect of iridium on platinum in reforming catalysts. And that's what we're going to propose with some indirect evidence is actually happening in the cobalt ruthenium system. First of all, how do we go about making these kinds of materials? Well, we're going to start with cobalt titania. And by the way, I, I neglected to tell you that most of the effects that you're going to see here are not going to be enhanced reducibility, because these catalysts are almost completely reduced at the pretreatment conditions that we work. But let's take a cobalt titania catalyst, prepare it by a standard set of conditions, take it at this point after reduction, and passivate. And that's going to be our standard material. Next, we're going to take this, this catalyst and we're going to introduce by a similar impregnation technique a small amount of ruthenium. How small it is will become clear in a moment. And we're going to do two types of pretreatment. One of them is we're going to directly reduce this catalyst in much the same way as we did that one. And the second one is we're going to do a calcination treatment. We're going to do an oxidation treatment at fairly high temperature and then reduce that catalyst and see if it makes any difference. Two things I ought to point out to you. If you look at the amount of ruthenium that we work with, we're talking about ratios of one ruthenium atom to about 150 cobalt atoms. That's quite a small amount of ruthenium to make very much of a difference. The other one is that in contrast with what you just heard about rhenium about and platinum, the dispersion of the material, which is quite low, does not increase as a result of having that ruthenium put into that structure, either after reduction or after the calcination reduction treatment. What does this mean? I ought to expect that if the ruthenium is a structural promoter, it's a lousy one because it hasn't done very much. So I, have not, I ought not to have moved from the rate that I had on the monometallic, on monometallic catalyst. The fact is that that's not what we see. <clears throat> what we see, if we concentrate just on the catalyst A, the cobalt titania catalyst, and we look at the rate per total metal atom, per cobalt surface atom, we look at the selectivities and some kinetic parameters here, what we find is that the rate of the reaction has actually increased. But since the dispersion has not changed, that means that also the apparent site activity has increased. The methane has remained almost unchanged, there is a small decrease, and this A5 plus selectivity, Bishop-Trope synthesis type selectivity, has increased somewhat. The kinetic parameters are unaffected, and that ought to raise a flag that if this is a chemical promotion effect, it is one that somehow is not changing the pathways, because those, kinetic, those activation energies are almost identical. And the other thing is, if you look at the chain growth probability, and in order to avoid arguments in the audience, I'm going to take it after C20, where the lines are truly straight lines. And those asymptotic chain growth probabilities are characteristic of cobalt. They're very similar whether you have cobalt ruthenium or not. Now, we have put ruthenium. Ruthenium is a fissiotrope synthesis catalyst. What if it brought with them its intrinsic activity for fissiotropes? And what if all the ruthenium that I put in there went to the surface? I would get about a 20% increase in that site time yield, because ruthenium on a per site basis is actually slightly less active than cobalt is. But what we see is almost a twofold increase. What we see are kinetic activation energies which are more typical of cobalt than they are of ruthenium. And what we see is a chain growth probability that is quite unlike what you find on ruthenium, which is 0.96 to 0.97. So this behaves like a cobalt catalyst, but this cobalt catalyst has a higher rate or a larger number of sites. What happens when you now calcine this catalyst is you enhance this apparent interaction. And you get an additional increase in the rate which since I told you the dispersion has not increased, it's remained constant, translates into an even higher apparent site activity. And now you begin to see some rather dramatic changes in selectivity. 
at a given conversion, you're actually seeing lower methane cell activities, higher C5 plus is what you want in a fission trough catalyst. High molecular weights with high rates. And that's what the calcination reduction additionally does after that addition of ruthenium. Look at what has happened here. The activation energies and the asymptotic chain growth probabilities have not changed very much from the starting material. So what does it look like? With the possible exception of this change in selectivity, which I can actually explain by looking at what causes C5 plus selectivity to change in this system, there is really very little change. The reason that that C5 plus selectivity increases is because you're operating with a catalyst that appears to have a higher density of sites. You haven't enhanced the rate of a secondary reaction, all of in reabsorption, and you're actually enhancing chain growth. I don't want to go into why that happens, but the fact is that you do not have to change chain growth kinetics in any way to explain that C5 plus increase. Well, look at what we have done. Inadvertently as it may have been, we have introduced a, an apparent chemical promotion effect. Now we have some catalysts here. This is cobalt ruthenium on titania. This is cobalt ruthenium on silica. Both of them have moved from the line on which they were to what may or may not be another line up here. What matters after all is that when you look at the site time yield for those catalysts, this one is about threefold higher than it was down here. And we've managed to do it without changing any kinetic parameters and without changing the intrinsic chain growth kinetics of cobalt. Not surprising, we have a very small amount of ruthenium. Even if all of it went to the surface, you couldn't explain these kinds of a difference or introduce ruthenium behavior. Then the question is why? Well, the only alternative explanation that you could come up with is that somehow you have preserved a higher density of active sites at steady state on those catalysts, and that the presence of ruthenium somehow has managed to prevent whatever initial deactivation processes go on in these materials. What is important is that the effect is real. What is less important is the explanation that I'm going to give you for why it's real. Now. <laughs> The next step is going to be to look at two things. I'm going to propose that indeed is a higher density of steady state sites, because I, I refuse to believe that nature can be malicious enough to hide a real chemical promotion effect under identical activation energies and chain growth probability. So I'm going to give nature the benefit of the doubt and say that this is what is really going on, and that the site chemistry is not affected in any way that we can see. Well, the questions that I want to ask is, why does it require calcination of these bimetallic precursors? Well, I'm going to propose that the reason for that is that you need to bring the cobalt and ruthenium within one particle in order to see that effect. That is not very difficult to believe. It would be harder to believe if they had to be far apart in order to see this effect. But it's going to be very difficult to find that ruthenium. Now, I'm going to find it, and I'm going to show you that it moves around and finds the cobalt when I do a calcination treatment. And finally, I'm going to show you some indirect evidence that both the reactivity of carbon and oxygen on that surface have been enhanced by the presence of ruthenium, and those tend to be the kinds of deactivating deposits that you're likely to leave behind during fissiotrope synthesis. Well, first things first, what is the usual way of detecting one of these effects when you're talking about small amounts of catalytic components? Is to use a chemical probe, right? Is to use something that reacts violently through the presence of ruthenium. And Anders Holman has already talked about something that reacts violently to the presence of a noble metal. And that is the reduction properties of cobalt oxide. This is cobalt oxide on silica. Notice this is a thermogravimetric analysis. This is the rate of weight loss. Actually, some people have suggested that I do this. So it looks like a TPR. But the fact is that that's what it is. <laughs> Notice what happens. By the time we get to about 650 Kelvin or so, we have reduced everything. We don't have the problem that Anders had because we're not on alumina. We're on titania here, right? And on silica, we also don't have the problem. But we still see the same effect that everybody has always seen when you put a normal metal with a base metal. Namely, that if you put them within the same crystallite, the normal metal is going to reduce the temperature at which the base metal oxide reduces. And indeed, that is what you see here. Both peaks, CO3 or 4 to COO, and then COO to cobalt, are actually moved to lower temperatures. It is only moved fully to the lower temperature when you calcine the material, when you actually have these two components in contact with each other. So if you want to call this reduction synergy, it requires that the two metals be mixed together in the same particle, and it requires that we calcine. More remarkable, I think, is what happens if you now do the same kind of experiment, but you use hydrogen and CO. And the catalysts have been pre-reduced, 
and you look at what happens to carbon buildup on that surface as you increase the temperature while you're passing hydrogen CO over that catalyst. Well, what happens if you have cobalt titania as you go on, you go past your usual fission growth synthesis temperature, and then boom, you get whiskers, metal cap whiskers. They're beautiful looking whiskers. If you put ruthenium on the system and you don't calcine, you also get these whiskers. There's no effect whatsoever. But look what happens if you actually calcine. You can go on now to much higher temperatures than where this took place, and you see absolutely no carbon buildup. This may not answer the question of what happens out here at this fissiotrope synthesis temperature, but it's telling you that either for thermodynamic or kinetic reasons, this carbon whiskers cannot grow on this catalyst, and that ruthenium has a dramatic effect on the ability of cobalt catalyst to actually build up carbon. This is physical, this is chemical evidence. Now, imagine that you wanted to get some physical evidence. Imagine that you had a catalyst where you have one atom of ruthenium, 150 atoms of cobalt, 2,000 atoms of titanium, and 4,000 atoms of oxygen. And what you wanted to do more than anything else in the world is find that one ruthenium atom and find out what's around it. What would you use? <laughs> you would use exaps. You would use exaps because it's one of the few ways that we have of locating ourselves around the coordination sphere of one atom and try to find out what is around it. Even exaps has problems with this when you have only one ruthenium atom and so many of the other ones. But the fact is that by using an X-ray fluorescence detector, we were able to get a ruthenium KH exaps that would tell us what is around ruthenium. I can't convince you that, um, that you should believe the data from exaps because I don't always believe it. But this time, I think the picture is clear enough <laughs> that we can't believe it. But if I tell me what you do is you look around that atom where that edge actually takes place, and we're going to concentrate mostly in the fine structure region where the information about the coordination sphere actually lies. And what do you usually that do at that point is you get what is called a radial distribution function. Treat it as an X-ray diffraction pattern, if you will. It tells you something about the position of the metal atoms around the ruthenium. Even though there's 150 cobalt atoms around that ruthenium, we're still going to look only around ruthenium. Now, before we start, you need some standards. The standards are ruthenium titanium, which is this blue curve right here. And the other standard is actually a calculator or predicted value that you would get if you had a ruthenium with 12 cobalt around it. You can do that by using mixing rules for radial distribution functions, which are fairly well accepted in the XF literature. Well, if you do that, you get that red peak right there. Now, let's look at the actual data, A, B, C, D. A, we have not calcined. And if you look at A, you will find there's a pure ruthenium peak here, and there's a little bit of mixing between ruthenium and cobalt right there. Look what happens as you increase the calcination temperature. Well, you may argue that the ruthenium peak goes down a little bit. I won't go that far. What I will tell you is that that mixed component right there, the one where you have ruthenium totally surrounded by cobalt, is certainly moving up as you increase that calcination temperature. And that tells you something about the coordination sphere of that ruthenium atom and how many atoms of cobalt are around it. It takes additional levels of belief, but the next step that you ought to take at this point is actually to calculate a coordination number and a coordination number that you can separate into how many neighbors are cobalt and how many neighbors are ruthenium for this catalyst. If you do that, and let's concentrate on the left-hand side right now, this is what you get. This is the coordination number versus calcination temperature. This is where we did our calcination in order to get that additional enhancement. This is where we did our calcination when I told you it was not calcined. It was just reduced. This is the total coordination sphere, which is increasing. That means there is some sintering that is probably going on. Ah, if there is some sintering, that means that we have induced some mobility, probably in the ruthenium, which forms fairly mobile ruthenium oxide. But more importantly, look at what happens to the ruthenium cobalt nearest neighbors. You may treat this as an unremarkable increase, but it's a factor of two increase in the actual number of ruthenium atoms that have a cobalt nearby. You have some of them interacting at the beginning. There's some mixing, but it's not enough. It doesn't give you the full benefit. Continue to do it, and you get additional benefit. Continue to do it, and you don't get any additional benefit. You just get sintering of the material. That's why we normally stop around here. Well, I'm going to assume that I either have pure ruthenium particles sitting on the support, or I have these ruthenium particles totally mixed with a cobalt particle. And since there's so few of them, I'm going to assume that every one of them has 12 cobalt nearest neighbors and no other ruthenium particles. Now I can go further. 
I can actually calculate how many ruthenium's are here and how many ruthenium's are there from nothing more than those data right there. And when I do that, I find out that there's more than an increase of a factor of two in the number of ruthenium atoms that have managed to find one of those cobalt particles. This is a pretty big cobalt particle. This is a few atoms of ruthenium. Why should we be able to get such a dramatic effect when we have such a small amount of ruthenium? Why? Because a ruthenium may segregate to the surface of that crystalline. Now, given that this is a cobalt boulder, I'm going to take the liberty now of saying that I can make a model catalyst, which looks like a cobalt foil, and I'm not going to put ruthenium on that cobalt foil, and I'm going to do some XPS measurements to find out whether things mix when I oxidize them, and whether the ruthenium segregates to the surface when I reduce them again. Well, that's what we did. We took a cobalt foil, and we actually impregnated it with ruthenium nitrate, and we measure now the ruthenium to cobalt XPS atomic ratio. We have not normalized this or accounted for the differences in, in intrinsic intensities of the two peaks. So just take it out as a relative measure of what the ratio of ruthenium to cobalt is on the surface. We start here. That's not very surprising. All we did was put ruthenium nitrate on the surface. Well, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to calcine it. We're going to calcine it and look what happens. What happens is that ruthenium almost disappears from that surface. Why? You have provided actually a thermodynamic incentive for ruthenium to go in because they're mixed cobalt ruthenium spinel oxides that are actually quite stable. So you have provided two things. You have provided mobility because ruthenium oxides are mobile, and you have provided a thermodynamic driving force for its disappearing in that cobalt foil. This is why they mix when you have them on a support, because you have both a kinetic and a thermodynamic incentive to do this. But the question that I wanted to answer was why such a small amount of ruthenium has such a dramatic effect. And the reason may become clear when you look at now this green line right here. And that is what happens now to that ruthenium to cobalt ratio when you go ahead and reduce that sample. And when you reduce it, sure enough, the ruthenium comes back to the surface, and actually it is segregated to the surface. Because if it was uniformly distributed, it will be down here somewhere. So actually, the reduction that you do <coughs> after this mixing calcination treatment brings the ruthenium back to the surface and may explain why such a small amount of ruthenium, one atom out of every 150, is actually enough to give you more than a threefold increase in activity for this catalyst. Well, in my view, this shows that mixing requires this calcination treatment. It shows that the ruthenium appears to segregate to the surface, and that so far, the only thing that I haven't shown to you is that actually this is an inhibited deactivation process. And what I would like to do is show you one more view graph and then ask Professor Holman to do some experiments. Because the answer to this question is to do the isotopic transient experiment that he talked about. That is the only thing that will tell you whether it is the K that is changing or whether it is the theta that is changing. Well, the one that I'm going to show you is, again, indirect evidence that ruthenium may have an effect on the ability of cobalt to build carbon. This is now the same foil that I talked about before, and now what we're going to do is we're going to do the reaction at some unreasonable conditions. This is not fission probes anymore. This is methanation. All right? But nonetheless, this is all we can do in the vacuum chamber. Well, the fact is that when you look now at the cobalt foil, and the cobalt foil promoted with ruthenium, and you look after the reaction at how much carbon was built on that surface, as a function of the temperature at which you carried out the reaction, you see sort of the same things that we saw in the thermogravimetric experiments. Namely, that if you have cobalt ruthenium, you at least delay the formation of that carbon well beyond where it actually formed on cobalt. If you let your imagination go a bit further, you can now look at what happens at the normal synthesis temperature here and conclude that somehow this cobalt foil has a higher carbon content on that surface than that cobalt ruthenium foil. So it appears that carbon has more difficulty building on that surface. It appears that the oxygen reactivity is higher because we're able to reduce these things better when we have a normal a, a, uh, a noble metal included. And if you think of what could deactivate a Fischer-Tropsch synthesis catalyst, it's either carbon or oxygen. It certainly should not be hydrogen. So let me conclude uh, by giving you first the facts. That is that ruthenium increases the site activity beyond what you would expect and well beyond what you would expect from an additive effect. So this is truly a synergistic effect and not an additive effect. This is not an enhanced reduction of cobalt, because this cobalt catalysts are truly fully reduced. 
We think that the reason for this is because during the initial passivation of that surface, during the initial stages of fissiotrope synthesis, you have managed to leave behind something that is more usable as a surface or has a larger number of sites than if you don't have that ruthenium around. There is no question in my view that the bimetallic synergy requires mixing and that that mixing is caused by this kinetic and thermodynamic driving force provided by the calcination treatment. Um, well, there's a secondary effect here, two here that are quite desirable and I didn't talk about. It. And one of them is that the selectivity to the desired products increases because this higher site density gives you a higher degree of reabsorption. The other one is that this is the only catalyst that I have ever seen where I can just shut down the, the CO flow, leave the hydrogen flow in and reactivate it. Most of the other catalysts that I have ever seen would generally require an oxygen treatment in order to be able to do that. So quite simply, if you cut off the CO flow, for a little while, you will recover the initial activity of this catalyst, or you will recover from the long-term deactivation that actually takes place. I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of two people that are not listed as authors. One is Bruce DeRitas, who, do, who did a lot of the uh, experiments, the catalytic experiments here, and Juan Kim, who used to be in an analytical department, who helped us quite a bit with the XPS studies. Thank you. Choose your own question. <laughs> <laughs> if you want me to do, let me see where my friends are. <laughs> Both <Both done>. guys. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now be nice. So, <laughs> some 25 years ago, when we studied the uh, surface enrichment of alloys, uh, we, it was, for instance, platinum gold, and uh, if you know that, of course, found that in ultra vacuum, the surface is gold rich. Uh, as soon as you have carbon monoxide, uh, it changes right. and it becomes rich in yeah. platinum because mm -hmm. it forms a stronger bond. You showed that in hydrogen, the surface gets already somewhat enriched in ruthenium. Right. You did not tell us uh, what happens in CO because that is the uh, um, s most strongly adsorbed uh, species of the fischer right. um, uh, ingredients. Uh, so uh, that should determine, in yeah. first approximation, well, the, uh, the extent of surface enrichment with ruthenium. Yes. And I think uh, what I, I guess the reason we stopped at hydrogen is that even in hydrogen, you get almost total segregation of ruthenium to the surface. CO would only make matters even worse. Well, better in this case, because we get more ruthenium on the surface. The fact is that we have assumed, in order to take into account the potential additive effect of ruthenium, that all of it is at the surface. So we've already taken the best possible case, if you will, to make that calculation. I believe that at CO hydrogen conditions, especially at high pressure, uh, you will get significant segregation. The reason that is complicated is because you additionally have water in the system. Of course. And it isn't clear to me what water will now do us. Uh, the strongest adsorbent is the carbon monoxide, so that would dominate. That well, would but if you begin to form metal oxygen bonds, the cobalt will go to the surface for the same reason it goes to the surface during the calcination treatment. So which one wins? It depends on what conversion you're at in that reaction. I, I would the other way. By the way, the increase in, in, in chain growth and, and so forth, uh, I would say this is typically an effect of mixed ensembles. Uh, no, I disagree with you. <laughs> May I show one more slide? Because I jumped over it thinking that no one wanted to talk about this. This is the C5 plus selectivity. Okay? These are three catalysts. This is cobalt titanium. This is cobalt titanium that by going to a higher loading, and higher dispersion, we have managed to put a higher site density on it. Okay? This is cobalt ruthenium titanium. Cobalt ruthenium titanium looks like nothing more than a cobalt catalyst where you have about three times the number of sites. Those numbers that you see there are the site densities. This falls on a line that, or a curve that we have put together where site density actually enhances the rate or decreases the probability that you will leave before reabsorption <coughs> and increase chain growth. You may very well be right. The only comment that I will make is there is no need to invoke that in order to explain that change in selectivity. Yeah. And there she's going to do the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is the effect of increasing the amount of ruthenium? What is the effect of increasing the amount of ruthenium? Um, well, the bimetallic synergy increases somewhat, but it's less than linear. I mean, you do get an additional effect. Um, it, Ruthenium is fairly expensive, so you don't want to put too much of it. I guess we concentrated on this one because it showed most of the remarkable properties without an excessive amount of ruthenium. What I can tell you is by the time you get to 1% ruthenium, you really have more of an additive effect than anything else. When you pick the questions, so maybe partial here. <laughs>
Uh, you know, about a little over 20 years ago, uh, I did some work uh, with uh, Stanford, <laughs> and uh, we, we looked at platinum iron alloys and found that uh, if we tried to calcine them, we got these big boulders, iron, uh, iron oxide and platinum, and then we couldn't get the alloy upon reduction. Right. But you're getting the opposite effect here. Yeah, because I think we have a driving force, and that, those are those mixed oxides, spinels of cobalt and ruthenium, that make these things actually mix yeah. together. First of all, the cobalt is sitting in place as a boulder. The ruthenium is still probably highly dispersed. As soon as you make it mobile, it will find one of these and it will mix. So that's what I was asking. I how think that's you, the how reason. How can you predict uh, how this will happen? Well, I can't predict it, but at least I can see how the kinetics and the thermodynamics would be would favor mixing at high temperatures because they have a mixed oxide phase that platinum and iron probably do not have. Thank you. I noticed on your plot of site time yield versus dispersion uh, that there was a fair amount of scatter uh, for the cobalt only on uh, aluminum, or is it silica? I think it's silica. Uh, and when you put the cobalt in with ruthenium uh, on the silica support, the value is just above the noise, but when you put it in with uh, titanium as the support, right. it's well above the noise. Is that the one? Is yes, that the one? Exactly. That's the one. Okay. Okay. So the, the, the yes. round green circle is just above the okay. noise, just above the, the scatter, yeah. not the noise, yeah. but the scatter. Yeah. Okay. The noise here. Yeah. It's a noise between catalyst and catalyst. That's right. The noise for this point right here, you can't see in the plot. So I agree with you that it's within the noise or the reproducibility or the similarities among catalysts. Now, I think your question is... My, my why question does really is, why does titania lift you up so much higher? Yeah. Um, well, at least two reasons. The first one is that when we put ruthenium on cobalt silica, actually the anchoring of cobalt on the silica is weaker than it is on titanium. We're actually getting some sintering. Of the cobalt. So in other words, on top of the usual effect that you get, you're coming down somewhat now because undoubtedly there is some uh, centering that's taking place that we haven't quite taken into account there. The other reason may very well be that the ruthenium does not mix with the cobalt nearly as well. On This depends on actually the local concentrations of cobalt and ruthenium within a particle. The ratio is going to be different from here, between here and here for two reasons. The ruthenium cobalt ratio was different here than it was there. <coughs> And the mixing properties of ruthenium on top of silica may very well be different than the other one. But the noise that I want to look at is the noise of going from there to there, because I know that I can make this catalyst again and again and get it to be here without all the other noise that you see. You showed how the uh, ruthenium goes on the surface uh, after the uh, reduction. Mm -hmm. What happens if you calcine the sample again? Would, would you lose it? It does the same thing again. All those were different cycles. If you look, if, if you remember, there was only one that I colored, but um, but we kept doing it again and again. That's what each one of those is. You go and calcine it again, and you come down there again. You go and calcine it again. You may argue that there's a little bit of loss here. My guess is that you're not returning all the ruthenium to the surface. That's clear from the difference between here and here. You may actually be vaporizing a little bit of ruthenium oxide. But that's what happens when you That's do what it. I was concerned with, losing the routine right. since it is so volatile, yeah. the oxide is volatile. Yeah, it does not, from chemical analysis of the actual catalyst, it doesn't seem to happen. But this one may be well suited to do that because we go in the vacuum as the oxide at high temperature. We have time for one last question. Okay. Yes, uh, you did the reduction uh, at temperatures where cobalt should be phase and cubic and carry out the experiment where cobalt should be. Exactly. Do you have some structural changes, or, or does uh, uh, ruthenium stabilize uh, cobalt in a particular modification? This, the structure, I don't ask me which one it is, but the structure has not changed. What is some, somewhat unusual about this system is that sometimes you get stuck right in the middle of the transformation because it happens right around that temperature, and you get line broadening that has to do to incomplete recrystallization. But this one, as far as I can remember, remind me, Stu, you may even know which one it is that we had, <laughs> has not changed. You don't remember which one. Yeah, it was the same phase for both of them. And, and actually, given the small amount of ruthenium, it would be truly, I think, a miracle if we changed that phase significantly. Thank you once again.